The interest of the dealers in any particular branch and trade or manufacturers is always in some respects different from and even opposite to that of the public. They have generally an interest to deceive and even to oppress the public. We rarely hear of the combinations of masters, though frequently of those of workmen. But whoever imagines that masters rarely combine is as ignorant of the world as of the subject. Masters are always and everywhere in a sort of tacit but constant and uniform combination not to raise the wages of labor above their actual rate. It is not difficult to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in the dispute and force the other into a compliance with their terms. The masters, being fewer in number, can combine much more easily while the man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding for removing difficulties which never occur. And so they came, the women. They came from Sink Town and the hills beyond, from other mining camps 10, 20, 30 miles away. Women we have never seen before. Women who had nothing to do with the strike. Somehow they heard about the women's picket line, and they came. Uh, business leaders and elite intellectuals uh, recognized that the public had won enough rights uh, so that they can't be controlled by force. So it would be necessary to turn to control of attitudes and opinions. Uh, these were the days when the huge public relations industry emerged in the freest countries in the world, Britain and the United States, where the problem was most severe. As long as we keep the foundation of our business system strong, we shall be able to maintain and improve the way of life our forefathers conceived and established. And on this foundation of freedoms, continue to build a better life for themselves and their fellow man in the world of tomorrow. The basic idea is to present a picture of the world that looks kind of like this. Uh, there's, there's us, you know, kind of like big happy family in the community. Uh, the, uh, you know, the honest, workman going off every morning with his lunchbox, his loyal wife who's making the meals and taking care of the kids, the uh, hard-working executive who's toiling day and night in the interests of um, you know, his workers in the community, the friendly banker who's running around looking for people to lend money to and so on and so forth. That's us, you know, and we're all in harmony. Harmony was a big word. We're in harmony, we're all together, it's Americanism. You, you might take a look at that word Americanism. It's an unusual term. It's the kind of term that you find in totalitarian societies. So like in the Soviet Union, anti-Sovietism was considered the gravest of all crimes, you know. And the Brazilian generals had some concept like that, anti-Brazilian. And then there's those bad guys out there who are trying to disrupt our harmonious lives, you know, like that union organizer is probably a communist or an anarchist uh, anyway, and uh, uh, probably un-American, and he's trying to, you know, destroy all these wonderful things we have, and we got to band together and kick him out. When anybody preaches disunity, tries to pit one of us against the other, through class warfare or religious intolerance, you know that person seeks to rob us of our freedom and destroy our very lives. And we know what to do about it. You know, we have to defend our way of life against this. A lot of religion gets thrown in. Uh, they went after everything, the workplace, schools, churches, uh, sp even sports leagues were organized. The main purposes, you look through the whole, you know, you look at the movies and that kind of thing, were, there were two big things. One, of course, is to demonize unions because they're a democratizing force, so you've got to get rid of them. They're one of the ways, the main way in which poor people can get together and do something, become participants, not spectators, so they had to be demonized. And the other thing, which is a little more tricky, was to demonize government and to create what's now called a mood of anti-politics, 
Uh, and that's a little tricky because remember these guys need a powerful state in order to protect them. That's why Gingrich and the Heritage Foundation want to increase the federal budget. They're not cutting it, they're increasing it. But they're increasing the parts that feed them, like the Pentagon system that goes up. Uh, the, and the other part of the state security system, the prison system, goes up. You know, Those go up, everything that goes to people goes down. So you had to create a mood of anti-politics which leaves a very powerful interventionist state but makes people hate the federal government. And the reason to make people hate the federal government is it has a defect. It's not that the government isn't bad, but the things that they're worried about are not what's bad. What they're worried about is what's good. Uh, the government has a defect, namely it's potentially influenceable by the population. Now, private corporations don't have that defect. There's nothing you can say about the GE management. But you can do something about federal government policies. And that defect, for good Madisonian reasons, has to be gotten rid of. They have to create a mood of anti-politics where everything is blamed on the federal government uh, and you don't notice the real power behind it. You're not supposed to read the Fortune 500 issue. So once again, the election was essentially bought. Uh, nine out of ten of the uh, victors uh, outspent their opponents. Uh, McCain, Obama, of course, outspent McCain. The, uh, the, uh, if you look at the, we don't have final records yet from the final results, but they're probably going to be pretty much like the preliminary results a couple of months ago, which showed that both Obama and McCain were getting uh, the bulk of their financing from uh, the financial institutions and for Obama uh, law firms, uh, which means essentially lobbyists. Uh, that's for, it was about over a third a few months ago, probably final results will probably be the same. The distribution of funding has over time been a pretty good predictor of what policies will be like. Uh, for those of you who are interested, there's very good uh, scholarly work on this by Tom Ferguson at UMass Boston, what he calls the investment theory of politics, which predicts the which argues essentially that uh, elections are moments when uh, groups of investors coalesce and invest to control the state. <laughs>
Now, the classical theories of democracy way underestimate the costs facing ordinary voters as they actually try to control the state. You've got to find out what it's doing. You've got to sort through all the people telling you what your preferences are. Uh, and then you've got to try to push it across in voting. And then you've got to monitor what they actually do if they live up and effect to their campaign promises. And if they don't, you then have to do something to force them back on the course. It's that last stage that's the hardest. You know, I mean, that, that, that is to say, if the candidate doesn't do what you say, what exactly do you do? Well, try to get him next election? Maybe. Okay, so if ordinary voters can't easily afford those costs, typically, then who can? The answer is rich people, businesses. Take a situation where you, everybody, by hypothesis, knows that the whole population, except for the business guys themselves, want unionization. But if, if, if it costs, say, $1,000 to campaign, and that's way beyond everybody's income, the ability to, to raise it, it doesn't matter how many people want it or that everybody knows already that people, if you come out to them, they'll get it. Um, it's that you can't reach anybody with the appeal because you can't raise the money. To this day, despite all the noise about small contributions, and particularly on the Obama ca campaign, which made a big pitch that they were small contribution driven, we now know they were not. They were encouraging their people to break their contributions into small bits, often $200, and, and contribute over and over. And the studies that initially started reporting about how they were small contributor driven, I know the data sources that they work on. Neither they nor the data sources have good enough matching programs to enable you to get the same person more than once unless everything is matched. That is to say, you know, the junior, the, the address, you change a middle initial and stuff like that, you won't typically catch it. And so they just miss the, num the, the repeated contributions by the same folks. They keep recording them as multiple contributions. And when Obama did uh, organize a great a large number of people and many enthusiastic people, uh, what's called uh, in the press uh, Obama's army, uh, but the army is uh, supposed to take instructions not to implement, to I introduce, develop uh, programs and call on its own candidate to implement them. You know, typically not less than two-fifths to sixty percent of your contributions are going to come in from people over 500 bucks and often over a thousand. You could think of a modern campaign like Modern War as effectively the equivalent of, of shooting a dealer display floor full of Mercedes Benzes at somebody. That's a lot of doubt. So you need to keep refilling with Mercedes Benzes. And that's hard to do on small contributions. And the other side of it is two, the two critical points are is the voice is different between a few contributors and lots and there is no easy follow-up. That, that's the really critical thing. That, I mean, for instance, you can give, a bunch of us can all, you know, lots of people contributed to Obama. I know a lot of people who did. When they start to do things like, you know, appoint as they did, the former lobbyist for Goldman Sachs as a Treasury uh, Secretary's Chief of Staff, there's nobody who can come in and say, hey, you know, this is way wrong. But it happens in much party competition in most industrial states and pre-industrial states for that matter. Most of the time, that is unless, unless the population is actually organized in a fashion that allows them to sort of do this cheaply and easily, then power is going to pass by default to blocks of investors. And they're effectively going to compete to control the state. So what you need is an analysis of competition within the business community. Now this is competition with some real limits. I mean, it's like, it's not as though business communities compete to put themselves out of business. They don't offer higher and higher taxes on themselves. They don't offer medical care at their expense, and none of them offer unionization. Uh, for, but they will offer you something different. It's just historically people offering you public works or something or often investment in education, which has become virtually a formula. And the reason it's a formula is precisely because that's something that benefits elites as well as uh, ordinary people, at least those that get it. Republicans are different from Democrats, not because they agree to be different to fool people, but because they're controlled by different blocks of businesses. And while they have a strong commonality of interests on, on many crucial dimensions, they also really differ. An awful lot of political coalitions in the United States, the condition for existing is that the national income not be failing. When that starts to fail, 
that forces industries out of whatever coalitions they're in into new groups because they've got to get something that works. This leads naturally to an approach to long-term political change. Look at the rise and fall of different business sectors over time and watch how they sort of come into political prominence and sometimes fall out of it uh, as they get old and sometimes overwhelmed. And, you know, it's a particularly interesting way to think about the current financial crisis because, look, over the last 30 years, finance became absolutely the dominant sector in the American economy. It, it beat even high tech, I think, in the end, and it certainly beat out things like oil and gas. So, I mean, when you get to 44% of all your corporate profits coming from finance, that's an extraordinary situation. And, you know, now that leading sector, if you like, is in complete crisis because of the broader deregulation of financial markets. If you and I make a transaction, say you sell me a car, we may make a good deal for ourselves, but we don't price into that transaction the cost to others. Uh, and there's a cost, uh, pollution, congestion, raising the price of gas, all sorts of other things, uh, killing people in Nigeria because we're getting the gas from them. So it means that, say, gold, Goldman Sachs, if they're managed properly, uh, if they make a risky loan, they calculate the potential cost to themselves if the loan goes bad. But they simply don't calculate the impact on the whole financial system. That's an inherent market inefficiency. Common stock investments have helped to make our country prosperous and powerful. Owning a share in American industry is like owning a share in the future of our nation. But remember John Q. There is a risk. control the state, they get to run policy. And if they get to run policy, well, what would you like? Would you like your bank to be saved by government forbearance? I mean, take that one right now. Does that sound pretty reasonable? That seems to be going on right now. I mean, Bernanke was a client of the banking system. And in the Depression, the Federal Reserve was a sort of captured arm of the banks. And so in general, you may get to run foreign policy. You almost certainly get a tax law you'll like. Uh, you'll get labor laws you like. The real question is what don't you get if you get to run the state? In democracies, uh, the elected officials are responsible to their own citizens and consider their interest to be paramount. That's the theory of democracy. A president, an elected official, represents the people who elected him. He doesn't represent somebody else. Now, if you have a problem with that, by all means, let me know. In general, you'll get a block of issues that count to investors. That's often overseas. I mean, a lot of these folks care more about China policy and possibly, I mean, for instance, American China policy in the last 15 years was surely driven mostly by the desire of American investors, uh, especially the investment houses to get in there and manage money uh, in the Chinese market than any consideration about American jobs. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Um, now, nobody is going to campaign on that. So uh, in the public positions of the parties, in effect, each sort of carves out a kind of, quote, base for itself, which they keep sort of uh, repeating a relatively simple formulaic set of things to appeal to that base. And you can see this in the voting data that Andrew Gilman gathered very clearly. After the late 80s, the Republicans stopped the appeals to race, moved to religion much more. And you know the, the way you did that was to sort of keep highlighting issues like abortion, the Shiavo, and all the rest of that stuff. Um, you keep sort of manically concentrating on that in public, sort of building your base type stuff. The Democrats officially sort of aimed at women, various minorities. That, that's the sort of Tower of Babel you get in public. That's your mass politics. That's not the same thing as the stuff that makes investors contribute. Uh, the public relations industry makes sure to keep issues in the margins and uh, focus on 
personalities, character, and so on and so forth. Uh, they do that for good reasons. They look at public opinion studies and they know perfectly well that on a host of major issues, both parties are well to the right of the population. A day at the shore, the fruits of our free enterprise system. Who do you plan on voting for, sir? McCain. Uh, John McCain, okay. Uh, thank you. And why? I think he can run the country. And what is your favorite policy that he has? Protecting the country. Okay, good. And besides that? Uh, economy. Okay. And it's an economy. Good. What's, his, what's your favorite economic policy that he has? Hello there, who are you going to vote for? Hillary Clinton. Okay, good, and why? And what? And why? Right now, I think she's the best one for the job. And what's the favorite policy that she has? I haven't watched too many of her uh, debates. Only what I read in the paper and the uh, on TV. I guess uh, not Abby, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think Obama. That's Obama, okay, and what, out of his policies, which one do you like the most? Well, I just like him because he's a Democrat, and I don't really care for Hillary Clinton, so that's why. Okay, good, good. And what above Hillary's policies do you not like? Well, I I don't know about the policies. <laughs> and who are you voting for? Barack Obama. Okay, and why? Uh, I think he's the best candidate. I need. I think I need change. Uh, if Clinton is elected or McCain, McCain will be too conservative, and uh, Hillary. She is, it will be two and twenty years, almost twenty years of the same two families in office for the last, you know, almost two decades. So that'll be, I don't know, the nation's not built for that. I don't think. All right. And what is your favorite policy that Barack Obama has? Uh, favorite policy. Well, not not one particular policy, but just his whole, his whole, uh, his whole. So uh, what he what he's going on all together, like this this whole bandwagon of change that's all he wants you know to change and that there can be change in America okay and what change do you like the most uh, particular can't tell you Burnham who posed the question of what do the fluctuations in voter turnout over the course of American history mean? What you get is this stupendous rise in voter turnout from roughly 1824 to 1840. You go from 25% of the potential eligible electorate voting to like 90. And then at the end of the 19th century, you get a stupendous decline. Now, there's not much doubt what happens in the South to do that. It's poll taxes, literacy tests, uh, registration requirements, and a huge amount of direct physical intimidation. If you're black and you try to vote, you might just get killed. Or Mexican-American in Texas. The bigger puzzle was, hey, what's the rest of the United States doing with that stupendous decline after 1896? McGuire's study of the constitutions appeared where he actually did do the study what you want to do with a computer. He actually put in the wealth holdings of the founding fathers and see how they voted. And he shows you plain as day there are very direct economic alignments in the constitution. It's obvious as can be. Those who own the country ought to govern it. The people are nothing but a great beast. Government ought to be so constituted as to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. The American colonies during the revolution rewrote their state constitutions generally to give pretty easy suffrage. After the constitution is passed, they take it back. They put the property suffrage requirements back on. Those come off in the Jacksonian revolution. And the Jacksonians are definitely pushing that. That's because they think a deal like getting rid of the steamboat monopoly is something you can push. So I actually plot it. 
it's in my book, the concentration of wealth against uh, the rise in voter turnout during the Jacksonian period. What the Jacksonian revolution was about were these people paying to mobilize the rest of the citizenry. As these guys got more wealthier, got concentrated, they could, they could pay more and they did. Then the turnout decline is strongly associated with the spread of industrialization and that's the end of the story. excursus through some poli-sci literature, there is a point at which property imbalances become overwhelming and they drown out everything else. And so tensions in upper income groups absolutely play a basic role in allowing anybody else to get a say, sometimes. You know, I often tell my students, you know, the French Revolution started effectively over uh, the repudiation of the debt by the regime, which is true. I mean, there were a lot of other things going on, a bread riot plus a uh, default <laughs> by the state. In a multi-party system where the rules if somebody, if you, if, if you have a big farmer's block, that'll typically organize its own party. Then the business guys may in fact split. I mean, there may be one party's more closer to finance, say, than to the rest of industry. Um, it, it, often, you get a free trade party and a protectionist party. And those are both industrial parties sometimes, with the banks typically and with the free traders, though not always. And if you got a free traders versus protectionists, then they're very likely to be two different parties. I mean, you can have conflict going on inside one party, but boy, is that often historically very difficult to manage. 19th century economy, just about across the board, almost everything is hugely labor intensive. A great technological revolution. We can and are producing a lot more with fewer people employed in certain manufacturing industries. Now, this is a 20th century development. It's, it, it, it's the science-based industries, especially when you, when you go from coal to oil, and oil refining, chemicals, the electrical industry develops. We know, too, that oil is power for our factories. The machine age, which has given us a matchless standard of living, would never have been possible without oil. Practically every metallic machine in the world would grind to a stop if it were not for petroleum lubricants. Yes, these are the more generally known miracles from oil. But let's look at some less familiar changes oil has wrought in your daily life. At the heart of the capital intensive story basically boils to this. Imagine that you have all these businesses sitting in one group and labor starts to organize. Now, whose costs rise sharply fast? And the answer is, it's the labor-intensive guys. I mean, or just in pure tech, you know, if your wage bill is a big chunk of your value added, and they start to unionize, you probably flip out. And so what that says is what, in practical terms, were usually older American industries, steel, textiles, eventually the auto industry. These are all, they use enormous masses of labor, and they don't want to be unionized. I mean, this is, not just a question of we don't like unions, this is going to cost us like immediately. It'll also show in their stock price that that was a very late realization for me and lots of other people. The health care for retirees is dependent on General Motors stock. Now this means that the interest, my interest in health care is in conflict with the interest of an active worker. It may be in my best interest to close plants in the U.S., to cut wages in the U.S. so that I can get my health care. Well, damn it, I don't want it that stock. way. I do not want it that way.
The real issue here boils down to uh, have you any possibility of making an accommodation in sort of electoral terms between business blocks and parts of the workforce? Too bad. The men have always wanted to take a look at the president. But you come out here to settle the strike. Well, if that's possible. It's possible. Just negotiate. As long as labor's power is relatively weak, it's quite possible that the more capital intensive businesses will sit in the same party with them. Labor can get strong enough to drive them all out of the party. That actually happens. Much of European political history is exactly in that space. That just gives you a very simple line of thought here where you just so you can run on one axis the rising power of labor and that just sets then you just put you know the industries on the left axis going up effectively what you're actually sort of showing there is the point at which it becomes impossible for an industry to support any democrats now let's just mark down on a chart who's mostly for roosevelt and i've noticed it's mostly capital intensive industries above all it was the oil industry in 1936 that's where a great amount of roosevelt money came from on the one hand the new deal is the one case in american life where you get something like a European style social democratic outcome. You get, I mean, you actually get social security, unemployment compensation, the Wagner Act that sets up the, you know, the national labor relations frame, bargaining framework, a minimum wage. I mean, you know, when, when, when did that stuff happen in the, in the U.S.? You know, uh, I mean, all the things that they spent 50 years eroding, that was, you know, pretty much a few years, you know, all at once. On the one side, you get that sort of social democratic outcome. On the other side, look again and you can see plenty of business guys backing the new deal moreover when you look closely it's not socialism nobody is trying to take over american industry in fact they're sort of spending tons of money trying to resuscitate the banking system and the reconstruction finance corporation and give it back to private bankers labor got a lot stronger in the new deal but it was still relatively weak by world standards of advanced industrial countries small business story is they're so different. I mean, my, everything from Ma and Pa groceries to 100 person factories. I'm Rita Lewis. I'm the director of business outreach in the Office of Public Liaison. The work that I'm doing is really about reaching out to the numerous stakeholders around the country who want to have a seat at the table. Women's business organizations and women executives and women uh, leaders in their own companies wanted to come in and have an opportunity to speak to our agency review team and our policy teams about the work that they have been doing and how they would like to see this next administration move as it relates specifically to small business. We had organizations like Women Presidents Organizations. These are women who have revenues of more than a million dollars. We had organizations like Count Me In out of New York who really are about helping women who start and grow their companies and now doing additional efforts about moving businesses to the million dollar level. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Pan-Asian Chamber of Commerce. That drive to make a profit is what has always fueled our prosperity. What has always fueled our prosperity. And her company now has 78 employees. It's grossed nearly $4 million in sales last year. Tom Masterson, where's Tom? Tom's right here, co-found TEM Electric. Today, uh, the company employs 75 people and has over $12 million in revenues. Andy Wells, his company generated $54 million in revenues, and his customers included Coca-Cola and Boeing and Oshkosh. So small businesses like these are driving our economy. You're the job creators, responsible for half of all private sector jobs. You're the starting point for the products and brands that have redefined the market. After all, Google started out as a small business. Uh, McDonald's started with just one restaurant. And small businesses don't just strengthen our economy, they also strengthen our communities. You know, your customers aren't just anonymous folks who buy what you sell. They're your friends, they're your neighbors. Small businesses are the engine of America's dynamism. You create and sustain most of the jobs in the country. You are the anchor of our communities and you are ever more closely linked to the global economy. When you prosper, the nation prospers. And when the national economy is hurting, you bear that burden heavily, but you will lead us out of this. And in places like France, the, the amazing swings from left to right of the small business guys are quite they're quite striking. In some regions and times, they're all going down the tube, say because of a depression or something like that. You will see cases where 
they all support quite liberal stuff. It's clear, I think, for instance, that despite all the stories about how small business was dead opposed to the New Deal, when you go back and look at polls and things like that of the small, uh, there was a fair amount of small business support for some of it. An awful lot of the rhetoric that emanates from big business about small business is just self-interested garbage trying to tell you, in effect, worry about them. I mean, that's the sort of, if you want one generalization about American life, when big business guys start telling you how to kill small business, think big business and you'll understand it. In substantial measure, the food crisis plaguing much of the South and the financial crisis of the North have common roots, namely the shift towards neoliberalism since the 1970s. That brought to an end the post-war, post-Second World War Bretton Woods system that was instituted by the United States and Britain uh, right after World War II. Uh, it had two architects, John Maynard Keynes, Britain, and Harry Dexter White in the United States, and they anticipated that its core principles, uh, which included capital controls and regulated currencies, would lead to uh, relatively balanced economic growth and would also free governments to institute uh, the social democratic programs, welfare state programs, that had enormous public support around the world. And to a large extent, they were vindicated on both counts. In fact, many economists call the years that followed until the 1970s uh, the golden age of capitalism. Now, that golden age uh, led not only to unprecedented and relatively egalitarian growth, but also the introduction of welfare state measures. Uh, Keynes and White were perfectly well aware that free capital movement uh, and speculation inhibit these options. Uh, professional economics literature points out should be obvious that the free flow of capital creates what they sometimes call a virtual senate of lenders and investors who carry out a moment-by-moment -moment referendum on government policies. And if they find that they're irrational, meaning they help people instead of profits, then they vote against them by capital flight, by tax on the country, and so on. In the 1950s, in the United States, it was called the golden age of capitalism. And it was, there was a certain amount of output. So there was, there was this much output per capita in the economy. And then 40 years later, there was double that. Almost exactly, just coincidentally, double the amount of output per capita. So if you think about it, you realize that if in 1995, people work half as long as they work in 1950, right? And from 1955, um, then the output per person will be the same as it was in, 19, in the golden age of capitalism. So you, you sort of ask yourself, well, why aren't we working one month on and one month off? Or why aren't we working a three and a half hour a week? After all, that technological innovation has created a condition in which we could do that and we'd be as well off as in the golden age of capitalism. So why don't we do it? And the answer is because markets don't let us. It's not that, that everybody got together and decided we'd rather work twice as long. And we, as, as we could. And in fact, people work longer than they worked in 1955. People didn't decide, I want to do that. I mean, even the rich lawyers didn't decide, I want to do that. Rather, market competition compels it, coerces it. Because if you don't do it, you get outcompeted. So there's this drive to accumulate, this drive to, to work ourselves to death, in essence. Now, it's also true that that extra, where'd the extra product go, right? If, if, where did the double the output go? Well, it partly goes to military stuff to protect the system. It partly goes to police stuff to protect the system. It partly goes to cleaning up the ecological messes that the system produces. And it partly goes to the rich. And so the normal person is marginally better off. And in fact, from 1970 to the present, the normal person doesn't get better off at all. Joel Rogers and I wrote a book called Right Turn, where we sort of walk through the remaking of the Democratic Party in the 1980s. You know, effectively, the business Democrats run the basic modern Democratic Party. 
that, that was what Clinton and for that matter Al Gore and those people were all about. That's what all the subsequent Democratic Party candidates thus far have been to, including the current president. The folks who created this crisis are to a very large measure the folks who principally financed the Obama campaign. That's to say this guy is first and foremost a candidate of finance. I mean you hear all these government sacks jokes about Goldman Sachs, no reason to pick on them, that'd be unfair. Morgan Stanley, Bank of America. They're this big raft of hedge funds and investment houses. They dominate the early financing among large investors for Obama. I suspect to this day you'll find that the majority Democrat, the firms that can continuously contribute to the Democrats in big numbers are still at least vestigially more capital intensive. But obviously the big story in the 1970s and after, it's first of all the, the enormous role finance takes and then the harshness, you know, as I said in the private equity case of the 90s, you could see inside finance folks like Colbert, Cravis and Roberts, those folks when they get into the business of running companies and where your, your basic scheme is buy a company, grab the pension fund, pull the assets, as much assets of that out of you can, put it in the rest of the firm, bust up the firm, sell it and things like that and also fire a lot of people to pay down debt. That's in fact what seems often to happen in these takeovers. At that point you're beginning to act like a sort of classic capitalist. What you've got there is you'll often find these folks at very antagonistic to labor and a lot of the, the folks in the, I mean you get an almost 19th century approach to labor management confrontation. We turn now to a labor struggle here in New York. More than 130 workers at the Stelladoro Biscuit Company in the Bronx have ended an 11 month strike. The workers returned to their jobs on Wednesday a week after the National Labor Relations Board ordered the company to reinstate and pay back wages to the striking workers. The employees at Stelladora walked off the job last August after company officials tried to force them to accept a 20% pay cut, elimination of sick days and overtime, reductions in vacations and holidays, and an increase in employee health con care contributions. While the Stelladora workers have returned to their jobs, their fight isn't over. The company's owner, the Connecticut-based private equity fund, Brynwood Partners, is now threatening to close the factory within 90 days. It was a family-run company for many, many years, and then that got sold to corporate owners, first uh, Nabisco, and then the, Nabisco got bought by Kraft. So Kraft was the owner that sold it to the private equity company. So when they say it's not profitable, they really don't mean it's not profitable. They mean we don't get the super rates of profit that we expect. These folks tell their investors that they're going to return a 30 to 35 percent rate of return. That is an unreasonable rate of return. They're not an operating company. They're a financial investor. They're only going to keep it for three to five years, and they're going to turn it around. So their whole point was to reduce labor costs to the point where they could get another buyer to come in and have a, a contract that was gutted. You know, some of it was financial, and some of it was issues of control, not just uh, financial. Like one of the provisions in this contract, it's an old kind of, if people know CIO, it's an old industrial contract. We have a provision that says that the cookies will have union labels on them. So that was one of their proposals, to take off the union labels from the packaging. Now that doesn't save them any money, it's just an issue of who's controlling what. I try organizing in uh, one of the U.S. client states in Latin America, you can get your brains blown out, in Colombia, for example. The relationship between the United States and Colombia has been extremely strong. Uh, we've uh, had great cooperation on a whole range of issues, uh, and President uh, Uribe's administration, I think, has, under very difficult circumstances, uh, performed admirably on a whole range of fronts, uh, on security, in improving the economic situation for his people, uh, and stabilizing the country. Uh, he has performed with diligence uh, and courage, and so we are grateful for his friendship. Uh, we've discussed most prominently the interests of both countries in moving forward on a free trade agreement. This has to do with a fact that was mentioned by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky in their book, The Washington Connection and Third World Fascism, namely that what is sought in the third world is a favorable climate of investment. This means 
imposing authoritarian measures to undermine unions, welfare programs, and governments that may use the resources of a country for its own people, rather than giving preference to the open-door policies sought by foreign investors. In fact, Chomsky and Herman established a double correlation. The more favorable the investment climate, the more human rights violations and U.S. aid increased. The evidence presented in their later book, Manufacturing Consent, proves that this favorable investment climate was supported by the corporate media. This was done by whitewashing crimes and corrupt elections in third world countries that were subordinate to foreign investors while attacking governments resisting foreign exploitation. Well, you can get the JP to swear out peace bombs, or you can heist the bail high enough to keep him in jail. Keep him? What am I supposed to do? Feed him out of my own pocket? What I want to know, Mr. Hartwell, is when are you going to settle this thing? You want to negotiate with him? What do you want, anyway? Company has other minds. Got to see the larger picture. Once these people get out of hand, America smashed this place with big bombs, more than two million tons in the time of the Vietnam War, which is more than what was dropped by all of the Allies together during the the whole of the Second World War. So Laos has a, a huge large bomb problem and they, they lose a lot of people every year. Since the war ended, in excess of 12,000 people have been killed or injured by bombs or other remnants of war. 30% of these items didn't explode and remain live today. But in many areas, it's near impossible to farm people blow themselves up whilst cultivating the land. Uh, this has kept people poor and, you know, the, the new cash crop now, I suppose, is scrap metal. Well, the Cold War, in effect, was a war of the United States against the Third World and of Russia against its much smaller domains in Eastern Europe. Uh, each great power used the other's threats as a pretext. The major objectives in Vietnam are pretty much what they were in Cuba, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Congo, all around the world. Uh, they were afraid that uh, Vietnam was going to undergo successful social and economic development, and as it's put in high places, the rot might spread to others. It might lead to ideological victories for the mode of socioeconomic development that they're pursuing. The virus might infect others, as uh, Kissinger put it with regard to Chile. Well, when you have a virus, what do you do with it? You kill the virus and you inoculate the potential victims, and that's what happened. Indochina was killed, you know, not gonna, you know, maybe it'll survive, but it's not gonna be a model for anything. And the surrounding region was inoculated. Uh, in the 60s and early 70s, uh, the U.S. succeeded in installing brutal and vicious military dictators in every country. And that stopped the, uh, prevented the rot from spreading. After World War II, you would be involved in some international political adventure. Now, when you studied the roots of some of these, you came quickly to the conclusion that this is really about American business abroad. Maybe it's, you know, they don't want to be nationalized or they were not or something. And so we're supporting a government somewhere. This is directed toward some economic objective here. You had folks making decisions where there was a perceived risk of a nuclear exchange. For what is in effect an interest that, you know, I wouldn't call a vital interest of anybody except the corporations involved. I myself ran a study of intervention and what I did was take the cases of known cases of U.S. troops that have been dispatched abroad and I used a Library of Congress study and then I combined a number of databases and added some got that out. And what I discovered was pretty interesting. It was that the tendency to intervention under Clinton didn't change at all from the rate under Reagan and Bush. I mean, what you, what you basically saw was a big steep increase in interventions after World War II, a leveling off in the early 70s as the sort of reaction to Vietnam, you know, the Vietnam set in. And then, you know, in, under the Reagan doctrine in the early 80s, it just takes off like a rocket. There was trouble in the land of Nicaragua in the 80s, it's true. 
And Uncle Sam has always said this kind of thing just really won't do. So he paid for a bag full of dirty tricks and turned killers into heroes with a PR blitz. Well, freedom's sure a funny word for what the Contras did do. You know, there are pirates and emperors, but they're really the same thing. Even the ones who say they just want to let freedom ring. Well, they do it big or they do it small, but only one goes down when they break the law. While the big one claims this really don't apply to me. Clinton did not change the slope of that. I mean, he was busily intervening about as often. On the other hand, I would have to say that I rather doubt the Democrats would have invaded Iraq in the same direct, blunt way that the Republicans did. I don't understand why this keeps happening to me. Well, not so long ago we thought Saddam here was a pretty swell guy. We helped him get the goods to make the Ayatollah Khomeini cry. But Uncle Sam decided it was not Saddam's fate to be the leader of his Middle Eastern client state that was sitting on top of a big, huge oil supply. In uh, AFPAC, Afghanistan, Pakistan, as the regions now called, uh, Obama is building enormous new embassies and other facilities on the model of. Uh, the city within a city in Baghdad. These are like no embassies anywhere in the world. And they are signs of an intention to be there for a long time. He's also, as you know, sharply escalating the AFPAC war. Obama's pressing the Iraqi government not to permit the referendum that's required by the Status of Forces Agreement. Uh, Washington's current objection to the referendum was explained two days ago by New York Times correspondent Alyssa Rubin. Uh, Obama fears that the Iraqi population might reject the provision that delays U.S. troop withdrawal. There's no question. These are all businesses. They share pretty fully in the, stu in the sort of conviction that private property ought to be pretty absolute. You can see that even in some of the responses to the health care debates. President Obama was talking at the Business Council and he was asked by one of the large firm heads there about medical care. I noticed, hey, that's a relatively capital intensive firm. And this guy was clearly railing on at the prospect of the one serious reform that would actually give you universal health care, which is you know, you've got to have a government sponsored program that people can enter. In, uh, in competition with the existing private ones. That's the, th that's the way you get some serious cost containment. Everybody knows that. That's why much of the health care debate that's about to happen is going to focus on it. Markets uh, just don't provide options which today are crucial options. Uh, so for example, a market system permits you to decide whether to buy uh, you know, one brand of car or another. But the market doesn't permit you to decide, I don't want a car, I want a public transportation system. And the same is true of a wide range of other uh, matters of social significance, like whether to help the uh, disabled widow across town. Okay, that's what uh, social, that's what communities decide. Uh, that's what democracy is about. Uh, that's what social solidarity is about, uh, mutual aid and building institutions by people for the benefit of people. And all of that threatens, you know, the, the system of domination and control right at its heart. All right, this year in 2008, something changed. For the first time, uh, the Democrats began putting forward programs which are towards what the population has wanted for decades. They don't really get there, but at least they're in that direction. Uh, first Edwards, then uh, Obama and Clinton. I don't believe that government can or should run health care. But I also don't think insurance companies should have free reign to do as they please. That's why any plan I sign must include an insurance exchange, a one-stop shopping marketplace where you can compare the benefits, costs, and track records of a variety of plans, including a public option to increase competition and keep insurance companies honest.
But what happened between 2004 and 2008? Uh, public opinion didn't change. It's been pretty much the same for decades. What changed is that manufacturing industry uh, started coming out in favor of a national health care system because they're being smashed by the costs of the privatized system in the United States. Like General Motors says, it costs them uh, over $1,000 more to uh, produce a car in Detroit than across the Canadian border because they have a rational health care system, more rational, not perfect, but better. Uh, well, you know, when a sector of concentrated American capital becomes interested in something, it starts to become politically possible and have political support. You know, these are things that people ought to be discussing and think about. What does that tell you about our about functioning democracy. Let's take, say, the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, uh, Haiti and Bolivia. Uh, in Haiti, there was uh, an election in 1990, uh, which really was an extraordinary display of democracy. There were uh, uh, grassroots movements popular movements that developed in the slums and in the hills, which nobody was paying any attention to. And they managed, even without any resources, to sweep into power their own candidate, uh, a uh, populist priest, Jean Bertrand Aristide. Uh, take the second poorest country, Bolivia. Uh, they had an election in 2005 that's uh, almost unimaginable in the West, uh, certainly here, anywhere. Uh, the person elected into office was indigenous. That's the most oppressed population in the hemisphere. That is, those who survived. Uh, he's a poor peasant. How did he get in? Uh, well, he, uh, he got in because uh, there were, again, a mass popular movements uh, which uh, elected their own representative. And they are the source of the programs, which are serious ones. It's, uh, they're real issues, and people know them. Uh, control over resources, uh, cultural rights, uh, social justice, and so on. Uh, furthermore, the election was just an event that was a particular stage in a long continuing struggle, a lot before and a lot after. A couple of years ago, they, there was a major struggle over uh, privatization of water, an effort to, which would in effect deprive uh, uh, a good part of the population of water to drink. And it was a bitter struggle. A lot of people were killed, but they won it uh, through international solidarity, in fact, which helped. What is communism? Now, it, it's Chile, a communist country. I mean, its economy is based on a nationalized by copper. Copper is their main export. There happens to be a very efficient nationalized company, Cadelco, which is the core of the Chilean economy. Uh, we call Chile the model of the free market. Uh, yeah, its main export industry is nationalized. Uh, land reform is supposed to be a favorite. You know, that's uh, you know, lines for progress and so on. We just don't like it when somebody else is doing it in a way which uh, leads to uh, successful defiance and uh, taking matters into your own hands. But what does it mean to call it a communist country? Or did they have land reform in Russia? Well, is, is it just curse words? They don't mean anything. Okay, yeah. You don't like it, it's communism. Right. If we do like it, it's democracy. It could be the same thing. In fact, what's the United States? Does the United States have a market economy? I mean, do you use a computer? Do you use the internet? Do you use uh, telecommunications? Uh, do you buy things at Walmart which come in container ships? Mm -hmm. Well, that comes out of the state sector. No. That's what MIT is about. A lot of that stuff's developed right here. Public funding, public takes the costs and the risks. It's developed in the state sector, often in the state sector for decades. Computers and the internet were in the states basically publicly funded through places like MIT and others for about almost three decades before they were handed over to private corporations. What's that? Is it communism? Pick whatever word you want. I mean, the core notion of at least traditional socialism is that working people have to be in control of production and 
communities have to be in control of their own lives and so on. The Soviet Union was the exact opposite of that. The working people had no control over anything. They were uh, virtual slaves. I mean, the Soviet Union was called a socialist society. And it was called that by the two major propaganda operations in the world, uh, the U.S., the Western one, and the Soviet one. They both called it socialism for opposite reasons. Uh, the West called it socialism in order to defame socialism by associating it with this uh, miserable tyranny. The Soviet Union called it socialism in order to gain whatever, to, to benefit from the moral appeal that true socialism had among uh, large parts of the general world population. It's just like when an American politician goes somewhere and his pollsters tell him, say so-and-so, and he says it. What I walked through in the case of the Clinton, the, the essay on 1992, I looked at industries significantly above the mean in support of Clinton. Uh, you, know, you know, oil and gas, capital intensive exporters, aircraft, computers, investment banking. That investment bankers keep showing over and over in the Democratic Party, going back to the New Deal. My fellow Americans, after these four good, hard years, I still believe in a place called hope, a place called America. In the 1996 elections, Tom Ferguson has pointed out that the election was to a large extent bought toward the end by the telecommunications industry, which poured a huge amount of money into it, enough to get Clinton elected, in fact. The 96 thing really does look rather like 2000, something like three quarters of the business community was strongly anti-Clinton. I don't think that percentage changed that much. So you're in a situation where I'm going to say, I'm going to stipulate two-thirds to three-quarters of the business community wants Bush. The hullabaloo if you elect Gore would be quite a lot. Some of the labor guys thought maybe we should have some marches to sort of protest this. They clearly were advised, don't do this. If the situation had been reversed and Gore had in fact, you know, won five to four, I think you would have seen almost chaotic scenes of the type where you had Republicans paying guys to go down into Florida and actually, you know, demonstrate. The consensus candidate in the business community was winning. Throw the hand in and, and collect your tax cut, too, was, I think, the dominant sentiment. These guys weren't trying that hard. You know, and Kerry th clearly threw the hand in too fast on 2004. In the end, the business folks won't turn the place into a shambles. They'll take a shot at it, try, and if they lose, okay, we'll take our tax cut and we'll come back next year with more of the same. Oh, see, I made Lewis a bet here. The Lewis bet me that we couldn't both get rich and put you on the poor house at the same time. He didn't think we could do it. I won. I lost. One dollar. Thank you, Lewis. After you. Certainly. <laughs> Stock market prices actually reflect major investor knowledge of campaign contributions. We know that congressmen and senators earn ex the highest rates of return in recorded history on their portfolios, which means they're being given inside information. And that doesn't show in any campaign contribution. I had a colleague at the University of Texas. He did a paper called Death of a Congressman. What he quickly discovers is that if they die unexpectedly, the stocks of the companies they're close to crash that afternoon. That theme was picked up by some folks on Indonesia and Malaysia, where they looked at how the Asia crisis affected the stocks of, remember when Mater and his rival, uh, Anwar, went down in Malaysia at Mater's hands. And it turned out the stocks of the companies that Anwar was close to crashed. They went down by something, my memory is about 22, 23 percent in the space of a week or two. But that was what political patronage was worth in Malaysia. I looked at that paper and I said to my, my friend Joachim Folk, you know, we could do, we could use this technique, which basically what you do is you estimate what the stock market's doing over about six, six months before or so. You try to sort of define a little event window, which is real tight. The idea is track what stocks do on average and then see if the ones that are politically connected or that you think might do better on average than that. And so we took that method over on 
probably the most famous argument about political money ever, which is, you know, the coming to power of Adolf Hitler. We worked this through, uh, it took something like three or four years, and what we showed was like the last 25 years of American history and German history on this was all wrong. That in fact, yeah, big business in fact did fund Hitler, a big chunk of it, sort of somewhat loosely the classical Nuremberg hypothesis is really right. You know, steel companies, IG Farben, Siemens, things like that, yeah, they were all into uh, this. And their stocks do move hugely, excessively. Uh, excess returns, as they say. celebrates the 18th anniversary of the termination of the Spanish Revolution and victory over communism. The nation's military might, much of it of American manufacture, acquired in return for bases, is on display for the occasion. Senora Franco and her daughter are among the distinguished guests, as is the Generalissimo himself. One of the colorful contingents is made up of the Moorish Guards. As a crack unit of paratroopers passes in review, the Cordillo looks on with pride. 18 years of peace and rebuilding. In the barbers' shops were anarchist notices. The barbers were mostly anarchists, solemnly explaining that barbers were no longer slaves. In the streets were colored posters appealing to prostitutes to stop being prostitutes. The anarchists were still in virtual control of Catalonia and the revolution was still in full swing. It was the first time that I had ever been in a town where the working class was in the saddle. Every shop and cafe had an inscription saying that it had been collectivized. Even the boot blacks had been collectivized. Waiters and shop workers looked you in the face and treated you as an equal. Servile and even ceremonial forms of speech had temporarily disappeared. Nobody said Senor or Don or even Usted. Everyone called everyone else Comrade and Thou and said Salud instead of Buenos Dias. You saw very few destitute people and no beggars except the gypsies. Above all, there was a belief in the revolution and the future, a feeling of having suddenly emerged into an era of equality and freedom. Human beings were trying to behave as human beings and not as cogs in the capitalist machine. You basically have two situations, one in which the population is quite well organized and mobilized, and then you're likely to see the whole of the business community retreat to one party. But otherwise, not. And, you know, just an awful lot of European history deals with situations in which you have fairly mobilized workers and often farmers. And so the business community may or may not be formally organized in one party, but they're pretty tight, cohesive, and operate together. The greatest divisions this nation has ever seen were the conflicts of trade unions towards the end of a Labour government. Terrible. They were acting as they were later in the coal strike, before my whole trade union laws were through this government. They were out to use their power to hold the nation to ransom, to stop power from getting to the whole of manufacturing industry. You want division, you want conflict, you want hatred. There it was. It was that which Thatcherism, if you call it that, tried to stop. Why? You know why as much as me? You worked down there. Could you see yourself not lifting a finger? I wouldn't stay down there. I'd get out. And why would you find it different? There's them on top and them below. Push up, 
we pushed down. Who's got more push? That's all that counts. I always had more. Hmm. Well, we had a bit. Not enough, but a bit. Enough to push the bastards a little. As long as you have elections, there is a there is a sort of old, there's a kind of negative check built in. You could just keep I mean, it's not much of a constraint, but it is a constraint. The constraint is basically this. You can just vote them out. Um, I don't think that's at all equivalent to effective democracy. All you do is you, put a, you can put a swivel chair in the Oval Office, but you can't make the guy or the lady who's sitting in that chair do any policy for you. economic distribution becomes slanted, and despotism stands a better chance to gain a foothold. A power scale is another important yardstick of despotism. It gauges the citizens' share in making the community's decisions. Communities which concentrate decision-making in a few hands rate low on a power scale and are moving towards despotism. And to find out what way it is likely to go in the future, you can rate it on economic distribution and information scales. The lower your community rates on economic distribution and information scales, the lower it is likely to rate on respect and power scales, and thus to approach despotism. John Milton once said that those who put out the people's eyes reproach them of their blindness. Indeed, minority rule corrupts the judgment of the majority. That's why only participation and self-management allow majorities to fully realize minority rights and private areas of decision-making. This means that current restrictions on participation in the name of minority rights actually enforce the herd mentality, undermining minority and individual freedom rather than protecting them. Undoubtedly, the greatest massacres and injustices in history have been perpetrated under the leadership or influence of elite minorities, not by the democratic impulse of the masses. Is it really surprising that the elite minority would try to convince the very majority over which they rule about the so-called tyranny of the majority? But no, that's not what democracy is about. how much say we have over our lives, how much influence we have over decisions. One person might say we should have majority rule. Everybody gets the same vote, we tally them up, 50% plus one wins. Another person might say we should have consensus. Um, our value for decision making is consensus. We should all at least abide or, or um, sign off on any decision. Another person might say, well, I think that maybe the one person should decide. Somebody might say that. I actually say all three and many other things. I don't think any of those are a principle. None of, they're all algorithms. They're all methods of arriving at a decision. But they're not a principle. One of them is right in one context, and one of them is right in another context. When you got dressed this morning, you didn't say to yourself, we should have a majority vote of everybody who's going to be there on what color socks I wear. And that made sense, because that decision, it was appropriate to make that way. On the other hand, if you wanted to carry around a boombox and play it in here during the talk, you don't get to decide that all by yourself. Why not? Because we all hear it. And the, the idea here is that people should have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree we're affected by them. Now, we're not going to be anal about this. It isn't to the sixth decimal point. But broadly speaking, people should impact decisions in proportion to the degree where they're affected by them. The norm, the name for this, I think, 
reasonably is self-management. You want to control the state. You better have some fairly serious party and press mechanisms that work pretty well. In effect, you need to be financing the election campaigns. The public the mind thing. might have funny ideas about democracy, which say that we should not be forced simply to rent ourselves to the people who own the country. Rather, we should play a role in determining what those institutions do. That's democracy. Unless we move in that direction, uh, human society probably isn't going to survive. We now face the most awesome problems of human history. Uh, problems such as the likelihood of nuclear conflict, or the destruction of a fragile environment. But why do you think more participation by a public, by the public, more democracy is the answer? It's the only hope that I can see that other values will come to the fore. I mean, if the society is based on control by private wealth, uh, it will reflect the value that the only real human property is greed and the desire to maximize personal gain at the expense of others. A small society based on that principle is ugly, but it can survive. A global society based on that principle is headed for massive destruction, and that's what we are. We have to have a mode of social organization that reflects other values that I think are inherent in human nature that people recognize. And that would be, I want to see exactly well, what you mean. I mean. What are human beings? I mean, in your family, for example. It's not the case that in the family, every person tries to maximize personal gain at the expense of others. Or if they do, it's kind of pathological. If you and I are, say, walking down the street and we see a, a, a child uh, eating a piece of candy and we see that nobody's around, we don't, and we happen to be hungry, we don't steal it. If we did that, we'd be, it would be pathological. I mean, the idea of care for others and concern for other people's needs and uh, concern for a fragile environment that must sustain future generations. All of these things are part of human nature. These are elements of human nature that are suppressed in a social and cultural system which is designed to maximize personal gain. We must try to overcome that suppression, and that's in fact what democracy could bring about. The way humans conceive of themselves, their ability to act, to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire, a spiritual transformation.